Welcome wrestling fans, welcome. Welcome to Curtain Jerk and as always I'm your host Jacob Grindy reporting for the main event Mark's YouTube channel and that's it. There's no more Dragon Suplex podcast network. Uh, everything's going to still be on Spotify under the same RSS feed. There is no more archives on Spotify which hurts my soul but go over to the main event Mark's YouTube channel and check out the archive. I've been crazy busy. Uh... I've been moving. I've been training for a marathon. Work has been crazy. The 2000s party went off. Uh, you know, it went crazy. You know, it was just like Raw 30 or something. Everyone loves nostalgia. We're running it back even further back. And I'll let you guys know about that. It's going to be on March the 4th, I think. We're having a 90s party. So maybe I'll jump on here on the 5th and let you guys know about it. Because wrestling fans love nostalgia, and now I'm slowly finding out through booking these events at work that everyone loves nostalgia. Um, I ran 14 miles yesterday. I'm running 14 miles again today, stepping up my training regimen. And it's a very interesting thing. You always, uh, you know, when you're in the marathon world, you hear about people training for marathons all the time. And, uh, you know, February, March, April is kind of marathon season, if you will. And then it kind of picks up again in the fall. And you hear about these stories about how people are, uh, you know, dropping out, not wanting to do it anymore. I ran 17 miles. I don't know if I could run 26 miles. And I got to admit, guys, that makes me feel really good about myself, not only because I've done it before, but uh, I've never really let that kind of thing get into my head. Uh, so much so where I just felt like not competing or I had to change my goals and regimens. Um, I don't know why I'm talking about this with you guys. I'm just kind of opening up for the, to be honest with you guys, this is the first time I've talked to anybody today and I'm just kind of excited to talk about all the wrestling that I've missed. The month of January is my favorite time in wrestling. You got Wrestle Kingdom. You got all this cool stuff that happens in Noah usually in January and then you also have the Royal Rumble, the kickoff to WrestleMania season. I guess I was so excited about it. I thought it was last weekend. I thought it was the 21st and ended up being the 28th. Uh, but that was cool because I ended up getting so backed up in uh, all the other things that I just told you about that I wasn't able to put a podcast out. So I'm glad the Royal Rumble predictions got out there on uh, January 20th. And we're just going to jump right into it. I'm going to rank every single match from worst to first, just like I always do. And we're going to rank the worst match. Obviously, the worst match was the women's title match, Bianca Belair versus Alexa Bliss. It was short. Bianca did her thing. Don't get me wrong. It wasn't a bad match. This was a, a good show, a great show, in my opinion. Uh, but the Uncle Howdy shit is just bullshit. I'm not a fan of Uncle Howdy. I don't I don't get it. I... Uh, I guess for a while there, I was like embarrassed to say, I don't get what's going on. I like the QR code sending people all around the internet to get little Easter eggs. But if you go that far out, you got to get back home. I could run, you know, 15 miles, but if I don't got my GPS in my hand, knowing how to get back home, it was kind of pointless to wear myself out to that point. So I think they went all the way out there with the QR codes in the story, and they got to get back home. They got to get back into the wrestling ring, and that's when Bray Wyatt, Uncle Howdy, and all this bullshit kind of uh, gets gets lost because you can't bring it back home. You can't bring it back to the wrestling ring, uh, and that brings up the second worst match on the show, the fifth match, the Mountain Dew Pitch Black match. You got to love the marketing. Uh, I wanted to review a Pitch Black. I saw a Pitch Black bottle, and I was like, oh, man, I might buy that for the podcast. I was almost, uh, like, outsmarting myself. Like, this is so dumb. Let me make it fun content to talk about how dumb it is. But you know what? That would mean that they were pretty smart because they got that damn soda in my hand. And I can tell you, I don't know. I know Baja Blast. I know Mountain Dew. I know Diet Mountain Dew. Uh, I guess I know Code Red, but those drinks have been around for over 10 years. I don't know any of these new Mountain Dews. I don't drink the Mountain Dew energy drinks. So if they put a Mountain Dew Pitch Black in my hand, then this match would have done what it set out to do because it damn sure wasn't set out to be a good wrestling match. LA Knight is great. The novelty of uh, of the, the of the black light and everything was interesting. But the match went on too long. If it was the novelty of a black line, this was a five-minute match, it would have been awesome. Uh, you know, kind of took me back to cosmic bowling and laser tag and things like that as a kid. So if I was six years old, I probably would have loved this match just because of the black light. So they, you know, if they're trying to get kids into Bray Wyatt, as odd as that would be, 
This would be perfect. L.A. Knight wore the right stuff. He's he's glowing in the dark. You know, uh, Bray Wyatt's glowing in the dark. They had a cool look. It was a cool look. It would have been a cool picture. But the thing is, it was a 10-minute story. And it ended with one of the worst things that WWE does. And that's these bullshit uh, crash pads where you can tell it's a fucking crash pad. It started in WrestleMania 17 with The Undertaker and Triple H. Undertaker uh, chokeslammed Triple H over the stage. And then he was laying on an obvious crash pad. Uh, WrestleMania 17 obviously held to high regard. But I hate that match because of that reason. And then... Um, you know, ever you would see it in TNA. I think Tyson Tomko. I was I was there live in 2007 Slammiversary. You saw Tyson Tomko fall off the stage onto an obvious crash pad, and then uh, he, as he fell, you saw the, the uh, the curtain that was covering the crash pad just lift up and show boxes and everything. Um, <clears throat> I remember WrestleMania 35. Shane and Miz took a giant bump onto a very obvious crash pad. They didn't even try to hide it. Uh, and then now when people take the Foley bump off the cell, they have a crash pad. Don't get me wrong. I don't want people to get hurt. But the option is either don't do something that looks stupid or get hurt. Just don't do something that looks stupid. Like, don't do the whole thing at all. Don't jump off the fucking ceiling onto a crash pad if it looks bad. And then damn sure don't jump off the ceiling if it's hurt. I'm not trying to get people hurt here. But I hate the crash pad. And the Uncle Howdy spot looked weak like... What is going on here with this bullshit? They already had the gimmick of the black of the of the black light thing. You could have had Eli Drake. You know, Eli Drake said he wasn't scared of Bray Wyatt. You could have had the story be like, oh shit, he actually is scared of Bray Wyatt. Look at this new Bray Wyatt in the black light, and then that could have got him. Roll up one, two, three. Let's move on to the women's rumble, which was really good, and we're gonna move on to the women's rumble right here because it was the third. Best match on the show. Uh, I just have my my physical notes here. I didn't take my notes onto my computer, so if it's all jumbled up, forgive me. Uh, Rhea Ripley number one, Liv Morgan number two, Dana Brooke number three. Uh, Women's Rumble. Uh, I loved it. Emma number four, Shayna Baszler number five. The ring filling up here. Uh, Bailey number six, B Fab at number seven. B Fab gets eliminated right away. Uh, Roxanne Perez, number eight. Uh, then number nine, uh, I can't even read. Dakota Kai, number 10, EO Sky. So it's filling up with damage control. Uh, this team came out at SummerSlam, made their big debut. They've given them titles. They've given them everything. I've been patient, but they're boring as hell. It's we've we, I've covered them <clears throat> from SummerSlam to Rumble, and I haven't given a fuck about them ever since they came out at SummerSlam. I'm going to stamp them with a shitty faction. Boom. I just laid down my stamp right over top of their foreheads. They're shitty. Number 11, Natty. Number 12, Candice LeRae coming out. Man, I mean, Candice LeRae and Johnny Gargano, they were considered very smart to go for, to WWE instead of AEW, which they are. They were smart. I mean, get the bag. But they've done nothing uh, for me since they've been on there. And that hurts me to say. I, I mean, I've followed them in the indies. I used to go see them at PWX in Charlotte, saw them on PWG on DVD, then followed their career to NXT, and now here they are, a dud of a duo in WWE. Number 13, Zoe Sarks. Good to see her on the main roster. Zia Lee, always good to see her. Number 15, Becky. Number 16, uh, Tegan Knox. I mean, chalk her up to a Candice LeRae without a Johnny Gargano. She is boring as hell on the main roster. Someone who isn't boring, though, Asuka. And then you got number 18. I can't even read my notes. Piper Nevin. Uh, 19 Tamina. So the ring's filling up here. Chelsea Green comes out. She gets eliminated right away. So BFAB and Chelsea Green get eliminated right away. If I'm going to rank the two elimination, the two quick eliminations here, I got, you got to go Chelsea Green. She's a total babe. And she made the most of it because she was talking shit during the entrance. And that got her the time. 21 Zelina Vega dressed up. Like a Street Fighter character. Kenny Omega, eat your heart out. She's dressing up like a Street Fighter character because she's fucking in the game. That was kind of cool. 22, Raquel Gonzalez. Uh, 25, Mishin. 26, Lacey Evans. 20, uh, you know, no no boob popped out. Apparently on SmackDown, she had a wardrobe malfunction here. 
Everything was taped up. Everything was good to go. She entered the match. Number 27, the legend of the match, Michelle McCool, coming in from the crowd. I think legitimately popped her kids. She might have done it just for the kids, which, you know, if you got to do it for someone, do it for the kids. Am I right? Then we got Indy Hartwell, Sienna DeVille filling up the ring. Number 29, Shotzi Blackheart. Or 28, Shotzi Blackheart. Number 29, Nikki Cross. And number 30, Nia Jax. Who the fuck cares? Who asked for her to come back? I'm glad that um, Eos, uh, or not, um, I'm glad, uh, oh man, I'm blanking on her name. Um, the, the girl from Stardom that drops the elbow. Uh, man, I'm just glad that there's no, you know, oh, oh man, I'm blinking right here on live TV. We're going to keep going with it. The girl that dropped the star, she injured her so much. She injured so many people. And here she is in the ring. Uh, it was bullshit. I, I don't I don't want her back. I hope this was just a one off. Uh, they made such a big deal that she was back like anyone cared. I don't think anyone was asking for this. They tried to do some Hogan Andre shit with her and Rhea, and it didn't look good. And you know Rhea can pick up some big people. We've seen her pick up Luke Gallows. We've seen her pick up, you know, tons of guys. Uh, and she can't pick Nia Jax up. So, I mean, if, there, if there's a messed up move between uh, Nia and uh, Rhea Ripley, I'm thinking it's Nia Jax's fault. Uh, I mean, maybe someone can inform me otherwise. Uh, the You know... It's filling up, it's filling up, it's filling up. It's, it, they're getting eliminated. You got Asuka. You got Liv Morgan, who is number two. You got Rhea Ripley, who is number one. Asuka goes out. Liv goes out. Rhea Ripley stands tall, going up against Bianca Belair. And I think that's a great, great move. In the 2021 Rumble, they tease Bianca Belair versus Rhea Ripley. You got the, you know, you got the strong woman in. Um, Bianca Belair, and then you got the powerhouse in Rhea Ripley. You can just, for a casual fan watching Royal uh, WrestleMania for the first time, they're going to eye up these women, and they're going to know why they're a big deal. And then, of course, if you watch week to week, you know why these women are a big deal. They had a great showing at the 2021 Rumble against each other. Bianca Belair has already had a standout match in WrestleMania against Sasha Banks. Rhea Ripley had a standout match in WrestleMania Unfortunately, it was to no one. WrestleMania 36 was Charlotte, but I think that was the best match on the card on that WrestleMania. So I'm pretty excited about this match. You know, we know these ladies. We love these ladies. Um, they're legitimately talented. Their characters are over. They got dudes on their side. They got, uh, you know, uh, Judgment Day with Rhea Ripley. And you got Private... Uh, not, oops, sorry, guys. Not Private Party, but... I'm just so excited about wrestling. I'm running everyone together. I didn't know the lady from Stardom. I still don't the know the lady from Stardom. People are screaming at me right now. And then you got uh, Montez Ford, Angelo Dawkins. Uh, so you can do a lot here with just the uh, people that are in their corners going into WrestleMania. Um, you can do a lot here with the Elimination Chamber, maybe having Rhea Ripley like prove herself. I mean... If you look at like how Rhea dresses and her whole gimmick here, the Elimination Chamber could be like a marquee match for her, just like kind of like the casket match with Undertaker. I mean, whips and chains, getting calling her mommy, throwing all these other ladies around. I can see it being big for her. I can also see in you know a triumphant Bianca Belair proving herself yet again in this Elimination Chamber. So I'm really excited about this Women's World Title match, and that's how you should be leaving the Women's Royal Rumble. But going in to the men's Royal Rumble, uh, the second best match on the card, Gunther number one, Sheamus number two, Miz, uh, crowd super loud, counting everyone down, you gotta love that shit, uh, they, uh, you know, Miz coming out, then you got uh, Kofi coming out, uh, we'll get to Kofi a little later, Gargano, Crickets, they were big for Miz, they were big for Kofi, Crickets for Gargano, I've already said, this couple is boring as hell on the main roster. Then number six, Xavier Woods, New Day. Uh, they did like some kind of wheelbarrow butt slapping thing. I don't know what was up with that, but that made me worry because last year's WrestleMania was gar or last year's Royal Rumble was garbage, and here we get some butt slapping shit early on. I was kind of weary. Uh, number number seven, you got Killer Cross. Eight, Chad Gable. Nine, Drew McIntyre. He eliminates Cross. Snug chop battle from Gunther and Drew. Number 10, uh, Santos Escobar. Good to see him in the Rumble. Number 11, Angelo Dawkins. Uh, 
the ring kind of filling up here. Woods gets thrown out by Gunther. And then you got the Kofi spot that never was. This is bad, Kofi. This is bad, man. I love Kofi. We all love Kofi. I don't know anyone who doesn't like Kofi in the whole wrestling landscape. Like Even people that don't like the New Day kind of have respect for Kofi. And, you know, these spots that he does where he doesn't eliminate himself uh, is, you know, a big deal in the Rumble. And here he is, two Rumbles in a row, not being able to do what he had planned to do. And then you could tell what they were setting up was a rehash from what he did a few years ago, where you bounce around on the chair to get back into the ring. He couldn't do it this time. He couldn't do it last time. And he was also rehashing something that he already did that he fucked up this time. So, Kofi, retire this spot. Don't retire. I'm not, you know... I'm not big showing you. I'm not chanting, please retire. I'm just saying, please retire this spot. Number 12, Brock Lesnar takes out everyone's suplex, takes the Royal Rumble to Suplex City. Escobar eliminated. So many people, Dawkins eliminated. G- Gable eliminated. Gunther and Brock stare down. God damn, do we want this match? Will we get this match, though? I don't think so because who comes out? Lashley at 13. You know, Bobby eliminated Brock. Uh, Baron Corbin comes in at number 14. Brock goes nuts and takes out Corbin on the outside. Rollins comes out, makes the most, throws Corbin in to throw Corbin out. 16 is Otis. 17, Rey Mysterio, never shown, because then 17 is Dominic. So there's only 29 entrances in this Royal Rumble. They should have done something where Dominic took his number and had another guy come in there or something like that. But I'm obviously being real nitpicky. Otis gone. Elias at uh, at 18. Man, has he floundered a lot, man. I feel bad for uh, Elias here. Uh, number I, And I'm also getting all mixed up here. Dominic was number 17. Elias is number 18. Uh, who was number... Who is number 19? I'm not sure. I don't have it in here. Finn is number 20. Uh, Gargano, oh, he's out. He's over the top. Number 21 is Booker T. Uh, really cool to see him. You know, obviously, they always do these spots in the Rumble where a legend comes out. This legend right here, you know, you know him, you love him. You get a pop when he comes out, but he doesn't overshadow the main thing. And I think that's a big point that they're trying to do here in WWE is not overshadow the current superstars. Number 22, Damian Priest. Number 23, Montez Ford. 24, Edge. He comes out. He throws out Priest. He throws out Finn. He gets some revenge, but we'll talk a little bit about more revenge later. 25, Theory. 26, Almost. Uh, You know, you got to love Almost. He's kind of filling in that great Kali role, and Braun, I think, is kind of filling in that, like, 1999 Big Show role because Braun comes out at 27. Um, Ricochet at 28. 29, Logan Paul. Texas loves him. Or Texas hated him. I love him. They love to hate him in Texas. Number 30, Cody Rhodes. I love this shit here. Cody Rhodes coming out. You know, sometimes the obvious thing is the right thing. And then you got Logan on one side. You got Ricochet on another side. They're kind of talking shit back to each other. AKA telling each other, are you ready? Are you ready? But, you know, that was kind of maybe behind the curtain in front of our face. And then they do a springboard where they meet in the middle. Of course, I guess in 2011, Punk and Kofi did a spot where they were trying to get to Ziggler. And then I guess someone found NWA Wildside, Caprice Coleman, and someone else was doing a spot in 2004. But I don't care if you do it in 2004, 2011, whenever time period you did it, it's going to look awesome every time. And those clips that I saw weren't as athletic as this spot, and this spot is all about athleticism. So I'm going to say that this is the best springboard, meet in the middle, cross body, double block, or whatever the fuck you call it, ever. This was cool, man. Uh, Logan Paul kind of looks like Will Ospreay, and him and Ricochet doing stuff like this kind of brings me back to... uh, when Will Ospreay and Ricochet had that match at the best of the Super Juniors that one year, it was kind of cool. It was really cool. Made ESPN. But then, yeah, you got you know you got the final guys here. Cody eliminates Theory, and then you got uh, you know Gunther gone. Brock and uh, we thought Logan Paul was done after that spot. He comes in, throws out Rollins. Rollins, big mad about that. Is that a uh, WrestleMania match? I could see that. That's a high profile um, kind of. Uh, 
like uh, crossing the plane, crossing the threshold into the mainstream for Rollins, which is good. And then you got a guy in Rollins who can work Logan Paul through a good match. So I, I love that match for WrestleMania. Would I like that match for... I don't know, like, another show other than WrestleMania? No, but for what they try to do at WrestleMania, I love that shit. Uh, Cody eliminates Paul. Gunther versus Cody. Number one versus number 30. You gotta love that shit, but somehow number 30 is the underdog. Cody on the apron, back in the ring. Cody in trouble. Cody Cutter. Shattered dreams. Long story short here, crossroads. Gunther eliminated. You gotta love the pyro. So much pyro for Cody Rhodes. The, the smoke before when he comes in at number 30 just is way too much. And then he stands on the ring, points at the mania sign, way too much pyro. And then they cut to the outside, even more pyro. You got to love too much pyro for Cody Rhodes. It's a staple, and what a hilarious staple it is to have. It's a good staple to have. Like, oh, you know how I do. I always have too much pyro, so therefore you got to have pyro, and pyro is awesome, so therefore you're going to be awesome every time you do your thing. But now jumping over to Raw, Cody, there's more awesomeness on Raw with Cody. Cody comes out. So what do you guys want to talk about? A nice little callback from his last promo he did on AEW. Uh, it says it's 62 days, so Mania getting me hyped. And then he gets interrupted by the Judgment Day. Dom says he should be the, or Priest says for Dom that Dom should be the only multi-generational superstar to go to Mania. I, I like this feud here. You got generational warfare. You got Dom get, getting beat by Cody on Cody's way to beat Reigns. All three multi-generational superstars, as we, as we like to say. Edge then attacks Judgment Day. Cody comes to help. And then we get the main event, Cody versus Finn. Bullet Club 2014 versus Bullet Club 2017. Edge is uh, back again. Attacks Dom, attacks Priest. Rhea Ripley goes after Edge. Rhea Ripley gets stopped by Beth Phoenix. Back in the ring, Finn does the double stop. Gets hit with the crossroads. One, two, three. Cody stands tall. Thanks to Edge and Beth Phoenix on the outside. Is Raw good again? I'm not going to get fooled. I'm going to watch the YouTube clips going into Mania, but I'm not going to spend my Monday nights uh, watching this three-hour program. I've been fooled too many times. Uh, changing the subject. Congratulations to Jamal Hill for whooping the legend's ass in his home country, beating Gover Teixeira. And winning the light heavyweight title, breaking down and crying, like almost hard to get a hold of for the the post-fight interview because he was just so emotional. The first guy on Dana White's uh, contender series to, to win gold in the UFC, going all the way down. You could tell whenever it's a Brazilian on the main event uh, fighting... Uh, another guy for the title you, it's pretty much telegraphed that they want the hometown guy to win they want uh you know the brazilian to win send the crown home happy but hill had other plans and he achieved his dream it was really cool to see that's what's cool about uh uh ufc and wrestling combat sports sports entertainment is you get to see people work hard and achieve their fucking goals but guys i gotta say i've been slacking in japan it's been weeks, and there's been big news, and you haven't heard me talk about it. And I think that this is now is the time to talk about it. We're going to be talking about the Wrestle Kingdom card that's called Wrestle Kingdom, but it really isn't Wrestle Kingdom. It's more of like, uh, what do they call it, brand, war, brand supremacy uh, in Japan. New Japan Pro Wrestling versus Noah Kiyomiya and... Uh, um, Inamura versus Makabe and Okada, GHC champion on one side, IWGP champion on the other. Before the match, Kiyomiya just staring a hole, staring daggers into Okada. Okada just not giving a fuck, not even looking at the guy, kind of bored. And then Okada has uh, Inamura in a kind of like a cravat style move, uh, putting his knee into his back and everything. Kiyomiya comes in to break it up and just boom, kicks one. No sell from Okada. Kick two, no sell from Okada. Kitamiya is like, oh, you're gonna no, you're gonna no sell me? You're gonna no sell the GHC champion? And there just seems to be some kind of um, like un, unspoken war between the legends and the veterans of Noah and against guys like Kitamiya, the new generation coming up. Like you had, uh, you just have like these guys who kind of uh, will. Just maybe do things like this. No sell for the champion. 
Uh, and so Kitamiya, you know, through watching Noah, you know that he's had a year of this bullshit. And he doesn't like Okada no son. But if you know Okada, you know, hey man, he's better than all those legends in Noah. He's sitting there, his time is now. But then Kiyomiya comes with just this fire wrap around boot right to Okada's forehead. He goes down. This looks snug as fuck for Noah standards. It looks snug as fuck for New Japan standards. He's busted open the hard way. Okada right in the forehead. And it's not like dripping down. It's just like a scrape on his forehead. Okada then sends him to the to the floor from the apron, knocks him on his ass, clobber and blows on the outside, and then it's on. They are choking each other, going at it. Kiyomiya gets thrown uh, to the U.S. announcer's table. Kiyomiya challenges Okada on February 21st in the Tokyo Dome. Muda's final match. You got to love this shit. And it's booked. It's booked. We since we then now know that it's booked from the day, from the show the, the night after. This match was awesome. The no contest was awesome. It got ruled a no contest. And... Uh, this rarely happens. I mean, shit happens all the time in WWE. It, almost every single match on Raw and SmackDown is, is a DQ or no contest or something like that. But this rarely happens in New Japan or NOAA. And it, this was done very well. It had its time to heat up. You had to rule it a no contest. It wasn't just one little thing. It wasn't like someone's music played, the guy stood at the top of the ramp, and then the guy got rolled up. It wasn't some kind of bullshit like that. There was just... Red Shoes just could not keep order like you need to keep order in a tag match. So now we got champ versus champ between two companies, something that every wrestling fan thinks about and talks about. Everyone always wonders, well, what if MJF went against Roman Reigns? What if John Moxley went against Roman Reigns? What if, you know, Kenny Omega went against Roman Reigns? What if MJF went against Okada? You always have compare champion to champion in your head, and you could usually only do it in a video game. And there's, you know, there's always these forbidden doors opening up between each company. But... It rarely is actual champion versus champion. Yes, we had Rich Swan versus Okada like a year and a half ago when Omega was collecting all the belts and everything. Um, but I think everyone kind of knew, based on the level of impact and the level of AEW and the level of Rich Swan star power to the level of Kenny Omega star power, what was going to happen here? Where, I mean, you you could argue that Okada star power is a lot bigger than Kiyomiya. I mean, I would I would make that argument too. But Kiyomiya has more to prove than Okada. And this is legitimately something you want. This, to me, overshadows Muda's last match on this card. And this whole card is put together because it's Muda's last match. This is super cool, super important uh, to me. Super important to me. I love this shit. So I was going to watch this match, and then I was going to watch the main event, but then something caught my eye. Shingo versus Nakajima. A match... Like this made me stop in my tracks. I honestly used to watch almost every match on every New Japan show, but obviously with a lot going on in my life, like I talked to you guys about, I'm not trying to complain. I love wrestling. This is something I do in my free time because I love it. But, you know, you got to kind of watch the newsworthy matches, but sometimes you just watch a match because you want to enjoy it. And this is one of those times I just really wanted just to watch this match and enjoy it. I didn't think anything was going to come of it. Uh, so... Here I am, Shingo versus Nakajima. All Nakajima snug kicks, locking in the octopus lock, strike battle, hard kicks, drop Shingo, bitch slap, brings Shingo down again. One, two, Shingo says no, he kicks out. Pumping bomber, one, two, Nakajima kicks out. Last of the dragon, one, two, three, Shingo gets the victory. So you had kind of a no contest, and then the main event, you had Shingo beating Nakajima, and then going into the main event. So I'm thinking New Japan has won over... Noah right now but Naito is, you know at now we know that Naito is getting heated up for Muda but we really didn't know that then so I'm thinking is Keno going to beat Naito what's going to happen here main event Naito versus Keno Keno mocking Naito in the five minute mark dropping the double boot Naito in trouble Naito gets some momentum Keno lands some kicks Keno hits a dragon suplex both men down at the 20 minute mark F- forearms from Naito Kicks from Keno, one, two, Naito kicks out, double stomp, one, two, Naito kicks out again, Destino, one, two, Keno kicks out, Destino again, one, two, three, Naito gets the victory, and uh, we now know that after that this match, Muda challenges Naito in the final match, so we have Naito, the current legend, LIJ mainstay, LIJ leader, 
going up against one of the best all time. You tell you tell someone who's only watched wrestling in the 80s, hey, Muda's wrestling his last match. They go, what? You tell people that watch wrestling in the 90s, hey, Muda's wrestling his last match. They go, what? 2000s, you know what they're doing. They're going, what? 2010s, you're, they're probably like, who is Muda? You got to kind of tell them. Then they get excited. Then they go like, what? Um, but, you know, this is the perfect last match for Muda. This is the perfect like opponent for Muda. Legends go out on their back. I think I think Naito's beating Muda. And we're definitely going to be reviewing every single match on that card from worst to first. Do we get a Tokyo Dome in February? you damn right we get a Tokyo Dome show in February. you got to love that shit. Um, and I know that I'm recording this on Tuesday morning, so all this news is going to be old news pretty soon, but we got to talk about it. we got to talk about AEW. We're going to be talking about two Rampages and one Dynamite. Rampage from last week, or two weeks ago, rather. Ortiz said that Homicide would call Eddie Kingston a coward from how he acted. Of course, uh, Ortiz is under the impression that Eddie tried to hit Julia Hart with a chair. Eddie hits him with the chair. House of Black is fucking this friendship up, mind-fucking both of them for no reason. There's no even titles at play here, and they're just mind-fucking these two best friends because they're fucking satanic black cult, and you love them for it. In a weird way. Dynamite. Jay Briscoe video package. Super well done. Still gets me uh, you know, choked up thinking about it. I don't I, I mean uh, it's rough to hear about someone you've just been watching for 20 years just dies suddenly. I can only compare it to Kobe Bryant, to be honest with you guys. The way I feel about Jay Briscoe is kind of the way I felt about uh, Kobe Bryant when he uh, you know uh, passed away and uh, in the uh, in the helicopter accident. Uh, but moving on. Uh, Adam Cole inspirational video as well. I was not a fan of Adam Cole's AEW run, but these video packages and that promo uh, from last week is kind of reminding me of why I liked Adam Cole in the Indies and why I liked him in Ring of Honor and why I liked him in NXT. So hopefully there's more of this and less of whatever the fuck they were doing with Adam Cole before, like reminding us that he dates Britt Baker, uh, teasing... Faction warfare between the undisputed era of the elite that never panned out. Uh, having him get body shamed online for being small, even though he's been small the whole time. What the fuck? Uh, things like that. Let's get back. Let's get Adam Cole back on board because he's awesome when he's on board. The Ass Boys and the Acclaimed Therapy. This was funny. This was funny. I want to see more of this. Uh, it was deep at times, and then it was funny at times, which is pretty hard to do in wrestling. Get deep and get funny. I mean. Honestly, the only thing I can think of that does that in modern wrestling is the bloodline angle. And you know what, guys? We forgot to talk about that shit. So let's just jump over to that. We have the bloodline angle. The, I forgot about the best match on Royal Rumble. How the fuck could I forget about it? I was so excited to talk about UFC. I was so excited to talk about Noah and New Japan. We forgot to talk about uh, the best thing of, of all of January. The match... I put the match in my top 10. I put the angle in best angle of the year. Roman Reigns versus Kevin Owens. We're jumping all around the wrestling world as we do on Curtain Jerkin. You got to hang with me. You got to listen to the whole program. You got to listen to the whole damn program. Roman Reigns versus Kevin Owens. This was an amazing match. Bell rings. Crowd chants Sammy Uso. Rock bottom from Roman. Frog splash off the apron, back in the ring. Frog splash from the top rope. One, two, Roman kicks out. Sit down, powerbomb. One, two, Kevin Owens kicks out. Roman lifts a finger up in the air. And all of fucking San Antonio acknowledges him. This is crazy to see how over he is. I love this acknowledge me. You can boo me. You can cheer me. You know, I may be a good guy, maybe a bad guy, but I am the guy. It's kind of a cheesy way to say acknowledge me they finally got it right here and it's it's good to see it got it right it took them years to get it right but it's right right now and they're gonna probably roll with this for a few more years and i don't mind because it's done right superman punch one two kevin owens kicks out super kick cuts off a spear senton one two roman kicks out again spear one two kevin owens kicks out again ref bump power bomb one two three Four, you could count to a million because there's no fucking ref, even though we all know Kevin Owens should have the gold around his waist. Kevin Owens gets taken out by Roman. Roman asks Sammy to give him a chair. Sammy reluctantly kind of bickers with Roman, but Sammy gets him a chair. It takes a while. 
only for him to turn around and get caught with a stunner. Kevin Owens stunner. One, two. Roman kicks out. Superman punch. Spear. One, two. Kevin Owens kicks out. This is awesome chance. Fill the San Antonio air. Fill the Al- Alamo Dome air. Roman keeps slamming Kevin Owens' head into the steps. This is looking brutal. Spear, one, two, three. Roman Reigns wins at the Royal Rumble, solidifying himself as a champion going into WrestleMania to compete against Cody Rhodes for at least one night. But then the magic happens. The shit had me on the edge of my seat here. Sammy is in the ring, and Roman almost puts the lay on him, but then kind of takes it back. The Samoan lay. He's not gonna. He's not oofy enough for the lay. He's he's still reluctant to give him this lay, putting him, you know, in the confines of the bloodline, uh, and wants him cut. You know, wants him to attack a cuffed Kevin Owens. Sammy doesn't want to, but Roman is you know kind of confident that Sammy will. Says like, do you want to do this jackass shit? And then gives him the chair, and then turns around to yell at Kevin Owens again. And then this visual, this visual of Sammy with the chair and Roman with his back turn, just got this American crowd to gasp. I've heard gasps from Japanese crowds, but I've never heard this audible gasp from 50,000 strong in San Antonio for a WWE event. This was awesome. This was this was awesome. This was crazy good. Uh. Then Sami Zayn hit the tribal chief with a fucking chair in the back. The Usos looked heartbroken. Honestly, this I'm embarrassed to say this. I used to not be, but I forget which one's Jimmy, which one's Jay. But one of them started attacking uh, Sammy. Solo attacking Sammy. I think it was Jay rolled under the ropes. He's heartbroken. He doesn't want to whoop Sammy's ass. He just leaves. And, uh... Roman Reigns is just mockingly tearing the lay that he was going to give Sammy and dumping rose petals on his laid out carcass. Rips off the, the Sammy Uso shirt. And so you got demise in the bloodline. Not only did Sammy Zayn do something where he can never come back, hit the tribal chief with a fucking chair, you also have Jay reluctantly not wanting to whoop his ass. Jimmy, of course, happily obliged the tribal chief. Solo happily obliged the tribal chief. But what I'm looking at is you got six motherfuckers and you got an elimination chamber coming up. I think you can do an all bloodline chamber. You got Kevin Owens, you got Sami Zayn, you got an Uso, you got Solo, you got Roman, and then that last chamber will be Jay. And the story now is what will Jay do? And I think Jay is going to it's gonna prove that Jay is going to join the bloodline again. But uh that could be the story going into the Elimination Chamber. And then you got Kevin Owens and Sammy versus uh, Jimmy and Jay for the SmackDown titles going into WrestleMania. You got Cody versus Roman one night. And then you got another night that needs to be filled. Will it be filled with Bobby and Brock? Will it be filled with Logan Paul and Rollins? Will it be filled with Rhea and Bianca? Or will it be filled with Sami Zayn? Helping Cody Rhodes win the title in night one, pissing off the tribal chief. So then we get Sami Zayn versus Roman Reigns at night two because they ain't no more uh, Rock coming back. We, I mean, or if there is, it's probably not. It's probably not going to happen anymore. You got rumors of Stone Cold coming back, but I think if you had Cody taking the title off of Roman and then Roman beating Sami Zayn in night two, I think. With as good as this storyline was at, at Royal Rumble, you could tell an even better storyline leaving WrestleMania, going into Raw after Mania the next night. And that would be amazing. And I can't believe I left it out of my Royal Rumble review, but I'm glad I picked it up going into this AEW review. And now we're going back to AEW. After talking about WWE, we're all over the place on this podcast, but that's what we have to do. Uh, where where are we? Where are we here? We got a uh, you know the the ass boys. We got the MJF promo, not one of his best, but still a good one. You also have Rampage from this week. Ruby uh, Riot get interrupted by Britt Baker. I'm tired of this WWE versus AEW women's feud already. Uh, it really hasn't even started yet. But Britt Baker and Hater are like the heels that get cheered, and then you got Tony Storm and Soraya, who are like. 
uh, turning heel, but no one really cares because they're hot, so they get cheered. And this is why you don't have everyone book their own shit because everyone just wants to be the cool heel ever since the NWO 25 years ago. Hot girls can control rich guys with money, and wrestlers can control Tony Khan, who is a rich guy with money. So you got a bunch of hot girl wrestlers, and you know they're booking their own shit in AEW. I mean, I don't know anybody, but this is how I'm eyeing it up based on what I've heard. Forgive me if I don't have the full story here, but shit, I mean, the writing's on the wall here, man. If, 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 if girls that looked like this were coming up to me and saying that they wanted to do what they want, I would say do it. And I think Tony Khan's kind of in line with me uh, on that. We got the same weaknesses here, I think. and uh, But he just has more money, so his weaknesses come out to real life uh, thing and not just a fantasy in my head. But we're going back to the ring here. Dustin Rhodes and Isaiah Swerve Scott getting into it backstage. I think this is going to be a good one. Jade and Layla versus Red Velvet and Hogan. I think this is going to be a good one. The mid card, the under card is filling up in AEW quite nicely. They just need to kind of keep doing stories so we give a fuck. I mean, 101, Jared's there. Hopefully he's helping him out. Hopefully Sanjay's helping him out. I wonder what's going on. But let's break down all of these matches from worst to first. Number 14, we got Hobbs versus Tony Mudd. Hobbs just puts him in the mud. Number 13, Jade and Layla versus the Vanity Twins. These twins need to go somewhere else other than AEW. They are, they have a twins gimmick, but the first time we saw them, Thunder Rosa killed their twin magic gimmick by beating both of them. And here, they have different hairstyles, so it's like you can't even see that they're twins. And I think anywhere else in the world, in the world of wrestling, would just be like, you guys beat twins, and that's what you guys do. And we will sign you guys, and then that's what you are, you're twins. But here in AEW, we keep seeing them, and they're ruining every single thing they could do. You could do the twin magic thing. Oh, that's gone. Oh, you guys can look alike. That's cool. Oh, wait, don't look alike. It's ridiculous. Number 12, uh, Jungle Boy versus Paige and Hardy. Jungle Hook versus Paige and Hardy. Uh, Paige and Hardy uh, not bickering anymore. I don't really know what's going on with the storyline, but this storyline needs a shit or get off the pot. Let's see some action here between Paige and Hardy. It's cooking too long. Ego's Edge broken up by a dive here. A lot of people say that everyone's standing around in AEW waiting to get dived on, but here is a good spot. He's trying to hit his move, but then gets taken out by a dive. Ethan taps out to the snare trap, and that sits at number 12. And number 11, Tony Storm versus Ruby Soho. Ruby with a side suplex. No future 1-2 kick out. Tony fakes an injury. Uh, holding her nose, uh, just roping in Ruby Soho. That was kind of funny. DDT by Ruby, one, two, no. Britt Baker distracts to get the finish. This was a good match. It would probably have been ranked well into the top five if we didn't have this WWE bullshit on my Dynamite show. And I'm not saying I'm not a fan of Raw, but this is some Raw shit, having the, the entrance play and then someone standing at the top of the distraction finish. That's some raw shit. And this is at the wake of her being like, I'm a I'm an AEW staple. I'm an AEW mainstay. I'm going up against Tony Storm and Soraya, who are WWE people. Uh, but then you do some WWE shit, so it just f- muddies the waters even more. And you also have Ruby Soho, who I guess is on the fence, but wouldn't she be a uh, WWE person as well? And then you got the Ring of Honor champion, who's a WWE person this all this is bullshit. Uh, number 10, Jungle Boy versus Ethan Page. You want to slap tits? I'll slap tits. Quote of the match. The reason it's in the top 10 is that, quote, Page grabs Hardy's hair uh, to attempt to not get rolled up, but gets rolled up anyways. One, two, three, Jungle Boy wins. Hook shows up, not letting his fellow Gen Z heartthrob get jumped. Uh, not bad. Not bad. Who, you know, why not? Uh, this set. This is what set up the match at number 12. Uh, number nine, best friends versus TNA. I'm calling them TNA because they don't have a faction name, but that's what people call them. This match was fun. Uh, no five star classics here from this feud, but you know, Jarrett, Singh, Danhausen, just people you know and you love, and you love watching them wrestle each other. Singh pins Danhausen one, two, three. Action and Dre versus Garcia at number eight. Action in control, Garcia. Uh, with the leather pants that was given to him by the Jericho Appreciation Society. Action jumps off the turnbuckle on the apron and hits uh, a springboard on Garcia. This was 
this guy's just going nuts here. Neither man can put the other away. Shooting star, one, two, three. Action Andretti gets the better of Garcia here. And that sets up the tag match that we'll talk about later. Uh, we'll talk about right now. The Sex Gods and Action Andretti and Starks at number seven. JAS pissed at Action Andretti. Keeps getting the better of them. Uh, we got a tag match here. This was a great match. But really, the story goes that Garcia hit Andrade or Andretti, sorry, with a, uh, a bat to give a Guevara the uh, chance to hit the GTH one two three number six Hater versus Sakura I know I'm shitting on this feud in the AW women's division but you gotta love Hater here working snug here Sakura's chest is bloody and red from Hater just whooping her ass whooping the legend's ass here Rebel and Sakura's young girl kind of getting into it Hater just works with such a cool uh, intensity. Sakura not giving up. Moonsault, one, two, no. Bitch slap, lariat, huge lariat, ripcord. Hater raid, one, two, three. Hater gets the victory. And now here we go into our top five. You got Darby Allen versus Buddy Matthews. Buddy Matthews may be the most underutilized guy in AEW, and that's saying a lot. Half skull on Darby. And then hoodie t hood taken off. Half skull on Buddy Matthews. What's going on here? stealing his gimmick no it's mind games baby we all know what it is in pro wrestling buddy matthews buddy murphy is just like the guy who dressed up as dr phil on dr phil he's fucking with darby coffin dropped to the floor lights out house of black on the ramp no love lost with sting sting shows up and starts attacking him we got a sit down power bomb in the ring by matthews one two no acid scorpion death drop looked a little sloppy but still effective Bitch slap, coffin drop, one, two, three. Darby Allen gets the victory. Cage versus Willie Mack. This match was just some throwaway match, but it was awesome. Brian Cage wearing a six-man title, unlike Dalton Castle used to do, so I love it on Brian Cage. F5, one, two. Willie kicks out. Drill claw, one, two, three. Cage gets the victory there. Hangman Page versus Wheeler Yuta. I think Hangman has officially wiped his slate clean with his punk bullshit, and I like him again. I, I don't feel like there's some bickering between the two now. Uh, he has uh, had good matches ever since he came back from injury. Hang, dive in, Yuta, dive in, sit down, powerbomb, one, two, no. German on the apron, spills to the floor, cross body, connect, buckshot, lariat, paradigm shift, sending a message to Mox. Hangman wins, one, two, three. Number two, Cage versus Danielson. This match was awesome. Danielson is just awesome. Crowd behind him. Danielson goes up. He gets caught with a scoop slam into the buckle. German caught the moonsault midair. Uh, suplex German. One, two, no. Suplex from Danielson. Uh, buckle bomb by Cage. Roll up. One, two, three. Danielson pulls it off. Gets the win. Cage attacks him after the match because of the bounce he put on Danielson's head from MJF. This feud needs to pick up. I can't see this feud getting all the way to March, man. Danielson's great. We know it. MGF is good at promo. We know it. Why are we tuning in week to week to see something we already know? The bounty, it needs to get a little sweeter. This feud would have been better if it was just a feud that went to a big uh, rating on Dynamite, but now you're dragging it all the way to March. I don't know if it can get there with our interest there. Number one, though, I got to give it to Mark Briscoe and Jay Lethal. Uh, this is the best match because I say so. Uh, when Jay came out looking like he was holding back some tears, that was the closest I got to crying over this whole thing. And, and that's the closest I've ever gotten to crying over any celebrity's death ever. But then Mark Briscoe uh, comes out hyping the crowd, trying to get everyone excited. He knows how people are going to feel about this. He probably feels it more than anybody. But he knows that it's a wrestling show. He needs to get the people happy. He doesn't want it to be a tear fest. He wants it to be a wrestling match because wrestling is what he loves. Wrestling is what Jay Briscoe loved. So uh, it's just really impressive to see someone as strong as him act this way towards uh, coping with death. I'm always really impressed when I see people handle death well. Uh, and he did it right here. And he also did it at, at uh, Jay Briscoe's funeral at the eclipse I saw of his uh, his speech there. Snug chop battle. Uh, neck breaker by Mark. Mark diving in the pick and pick. They're still going at it strong in the uh, picture in a picture, which usually you see like a rest hole or some bullshit. Mark puts an apron. Uh, Mark puts uh, Jay Lethal on a table. Hits a huge froggy bow off the top. Jay Driller. One, two, three. Mark... 
uh, just the strongest guy on the ramp, everyone else in tears. And then he just sits there and holds up both titles that him and his brother still hold. They're still the Ring of Honor Tag Champions. I don't know what they're going to do with that. We're going to find out what they're going to do with that probably months down the line. Uh, Jay Briscoe, all-time GOAT. You guys are great for listening to the show. I hope I still have your attention. Uh, I love you guys for listening. Uh, check out the archives on on Main Event Mark's YouTube channel. I'm going to be putting more stuff over there. But then hopefully you guys subscribe and like this show if you guys are within your shot of my voice. Uh, fly high. I'm out. <laughs>